Gracious Heavenly Father, we just invite your presence in this place, Lord. We acknowledge, Lord, that you are already here. Lord, you are ready to receive our praises, Master. Thank you, Master, that you give us this privilege, Lord, to just come into your presence and just worship you, Master. And as a church this morning, as your people this morning, Lord, we just want to do just that. Lord, and we ask that our praise this morning would be like a pleasing sacrifice, Lord. And our worship unto you would be a sweet smell and aroma. Come, Lord. Come and just have your way in our midst. Lord, we invite your presence here this morning. Be glorified. Be magnified. Lord, inhabit the praises of your people this morning. Amen. Amen. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Let's worship.
should stay in that place of just exalting God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that there was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, to attack him. And three times he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, would you remove it? And then he was told, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Even in, as we exalt him, we do that saying, God, you are all powerful. You're worthy of being exalted. And in that state, we often allow the things that are in us to remain, and which we ought to do as we focus on him. But it is good for us then to bring those things to him in light of this verse and say, Lord, here's an area of weakness that I'm going through. Lord, I've prayed about this. It's still there. Lord, would you let your strength be made perfect in this area of weakness? I wonder whether there are some of you here who need to make that prayer. Just say, Lord, strengthen me. In this area that I am weak, let your power be made perfect. Just sing that song one more time. And even as we exalt him, if there are areas of weakness that you really feel yourself getting hit in, then just say, Lord, let your strength be made perfect in this area of my Lord, we come to you and ask that you would let your strength come upon us. Lord, in areas of weakness right across this congregation, Master, wherever there are places, Lord, where the enemy is hitting, oh, Lord, would you come in power, in great authority, in love and compassion as you always do, Master. 
And would you touch each and every heart, Master? That we can sense and know that you are alongside of us and that you will lead us through these dark valleys, Master, into places of victory and shelter. For we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite our ushers at this point if you would collect our tithes and offerings.
Heavenly Father, we invite your blessing on this offering. Remembering, Lord, how much you bless us. We thank you that you will continue to be Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides so wonderfully in our lives. And we give this to you with cheerful hearts, asking, Lord, that your hand of blessing would be on it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Just a reminder of uh, our me membership classes for those of you who have indicated that you want to take membership at the church at Powai. It will be on the 11th and 18th, that's next week, Sunday at 4 o'clock, and again on the 18th at 4 o'clock. If you have wanted to do it and haven't done it, today is the last date. Okay, so let me know by this evening and we'll add you to that list. Also, for those of you who had wanted to go through baptism, uh, please let me know so that we can schedule the class as soon as we have the, uh, the number. So today is also open as well as next week. If you have your Bibles, would you look with me at the 16th chapter of Luke? I'd like to read the first 13 verses, Luke chapter 16, first 13 verses. With your permission, I'd like to read from the New Living Translation. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you're going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, ditches and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll, have <clears throat> that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him 1000 bushels of wheat was the reply. Here the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. This is a interesting parable in, in many ways. It doesn't fit the the role and the model that we normally have as we look at parable, parables. 
The first, we need to look at its context. It starts out with, now he was also saying to the disciples. He was also saying to the disciples. And if we just back up one chapter, we will see that that entire chapter, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the prodigal son, were all aimed at the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. That's in chapter 15. And then in 16, he turns and he begins to then include the disciples into something that he is teaching. But if we go right down to verse 14, it says, Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. So it seems as if Jesus is trying to send out two parallel messages, one that would deal with the Pharisees and their love for money, and the other to see how he could take this and yet build kingdom principles that would help the disciples in their growth. And so that's one aspect of it. The second is most parables have their, uh, the chief actor or the chief person as God or a righteous person or some, someone good. This one doesn't. As William Barclay says, and I quote, it's a story about as choice a set of rascals as one would meet anywhere. Kind of harsh words, isn't it? As much a bunch of rascals as you would meet anywhere. He's talking about a wicked steward or a wicked manager. He's talking about wicked people who owe money because they're willing to settle it all, pay only half. And then on top of that, a manager who was taken up with the way his dishonest steward was acting and thought that was a great thing. And so it just seems to be like, where's the good in all of this? How do we navigate through this and find some principle for us? But Jesus, as he always does, clearly lets us know when he is moving from the parable to this point of what lessons we can learn from it. But first, the parable. A rich man finds out that his manager is stealing money from him, embezzling. So he calls him and says, I'm going to fire you, get the books in order so that that can be done. So the man goes and he thinks about this and he says, my goodness, now what am I to do? I'm uh, too old to don't have the strength to dig ditches and be a common worker or a laborer, and I'm too proud to beg. One moment of honesty from him, isn't it? I'm too, too proud to beg. But then he says, ha, huh, here's a plan. I'm still in charge. I haven't yet been taken away from uh, the authority that I have. So let me call all these people who owe my master money and reduce their debt. So he calls one and says, halve it, calls another and says, just pay four-fifths of it. And by that, he ingratiates himself to them so that when he is out of a job, these would still be homes that he can go to as friends. That's his plan, that when he is out of a job, there will still be people who will uh, regard him as somebody and invite them to his, their houses. Now, the manager, the rich man sees this and he admires the dishonest one for being so shrewd. That's the end of the parable. That's where it ends. Then Jesus adds a couple of things that leads us into application. He starts by saying this, it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. It is true, he says, that the children of this world are more shrewd, are wiser in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. So basically saying that the people who kind of imbibe these values, who have this kind of a mindset, a worldly mindset with the wealth that they have, they are smarter than the people of light that they are able to kind of move very well within their context and do well. So what, you would ask. Jesus goes on then to say, here's the lesson. The first is a fact. He's saying that they are smarter. Then he says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Now that's exactly what 
the steward also did. He was using what he had to make friends. But then comes the shift. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. They will welcome you to an eternal home. There's the shift. Jesus is saying, do exactly what they are doing in terms of using what you have to build up friendships. But not so that they will call you home, but so that you will bring a change and change their abode from a temporary one and a worldly one to an eternal one. That's how you need to use your worldly goods. He says, use it so that it creates eternal homes for people around you. This past week or 10 days, we've been saddened, isn't it, uh, to hear about the death of uh, Dr. Billy Graham. And there are many, many tweets that are going on, many stories that are surfacing, uh, that just shows what a remarkable life he lived. But there's one cartoon, I think it was, that has be made its way around, and you may have seen it. It's a, a shot of Billy Graham standing in front of St. Peter uh, there. And uh, St. Peter then says, go right in. They're all waiting for you. And then behind is this picture of thousands and thousands of people standing on either sides of a center aisle waiting to welcome him home because they were there because of him. And it makes such a beautiful point, isn't it? He invested everything that he had into making sure that his friends, the people around him, had an eternal home rather than a temporal home. I don't know how many of you have seen this book, Crusades. Uh, if you haven't, pick it up. It just tells you all the things that he did in the early days uh, when the evangelistic association was starting up. But in it, there's a point where the people around him come to him and say, you know, we need to have a radio station. We need to have a radio station that can do a little more than the crusades are doing. We leave people, they go away at the end of a crusade and there's no way of continuing to feed them. And this was before Decision Magazine came. And so Billy Graham is not convinced, but he says, we'll pray about it. He says, I don't know how we need to do it. We need about $25,000 to start it, but I'm not convinced. And so he says, let's pray about it. And I want you to hear this prayer. At length, Billy said, boys, let's pray. He knelt by a chair. Walter and Fred lowered themselves to the bedside, and Billy really poured out his heart to God. They had never heard a prayer of such childlike directness. As at Los Angeles, when uncertain whether to extend the campaign, Billy again sought a sign of God's will by putting out a Gideon's fleece. But Walter and Fred were astonished when they heard what it was. Then he prayed, Lord, you know I'm doing all that I can. You know I don't have any money, but I believe we ought to do this. You know, Lord, I have a mortgage on that little house in Montreat. Lord, I'll put another mortgage on. I'll take the little I have and put another mortgage on. He's willing to take his earthly riches, all that he had, and use it for eternal dwelling. And that's what Jesus is alluding to. He says, be smart with the things that you have. We live in the world. And if we live according to God's principles, wealth, money will accrue. They will come in whatever way they need to come to you, in whichever job you are. But what you do with that is important. Not to make sure that you are popular in this world, but to make sure that your investment goes towards providing eternal dwelling for those who are in this world. I, I want to just digress and finish this because it just brings such an important point home. He went on to say, Lord, we need the 25,000. And he said, Lord, if we get it by 12 midnight today, we'll go with it. We'll go with the plan to have the radio station. And the people who were around him were happy because there were about 20,000 people in that audience that night. And they thought 25,000 won't be a problem. But when the time for offering came, Billy Graham didn't move from his seat. 
He just let the offering be taken. And all his advisors are thinking, what are, what's happening? If he doesn't mention it, we're not going to get the money. The whole offering was taken. The sermon was preached. And then Billy Graham got up and he shared with the people and said, this is something that we are wrestling with. And this is something that we need. We need $25,000 to start this uh, radio station. And if you feel that that's something that you'd like to be a part of, then we're going to be in the back. There's a little uh, uh, tent out at the back where we'll be seated and you can put the money in that and go. All his friends' hearts sang. They thought, we're not going to get anything. After the crusade is over, everybody just wants to go home. And yet, one of them stood with a shoebox just in the front of the tent, and people just streamed by, streamed by, streamed by, putting money and pledges into it. At the end of it, they counted it. It was $23,500, and his team was ecstatic. They said, we've got it. Billy Graham said, no, we haven't. He said, we said 25,000. And they said, Billy, it's just 1,000 and 1,500, it'll come. And he said, no, we said 25,000. And they all went back to the hotel. Billy Graham went to his room, and one of his um, mates went down to check for mail and see what messages there were. And there were three en envelopes there. When he opened it, one had a $1,000 pledge, and the other two had $250 pledges. 1,500 that made up the 25,000 that they needed. The reason I digress and tell you that story is this. When you are trusting God for something, don't settle for less than what you were expecting because the evil one can give you that less. He can give you just a little less and you think that that is what you should go forward with. Don't do that. Wait till it is clear that this is what God wants you to do. I don't have a much money, he said, but I have a home that's already mortgaged, but I'll take a second mortgage and make sure that there's eternal significance to the wealth that I have. I was privileged to do my doctoral program and I did my doctoral program completely covered by a scholarship. I didn't have to pay anything, including the visa, the travel, books, computer, everything was given. And it came to me because of one man called Ralph Waldo Beeson. He had made a lot of money. And when he died, he left $39 million to the seminary with strict instructions that it was to be used to find pastors in the United States and pastors around the world, bring them to Asbury, train them, and then send them out with no cost to them. Worldly wealth, but kingdom significance, eternal significance. And that's the shift that Jesus is making. Be wise. Here's something that you can follow. Be wise about it, but make sure that it's not something temporal. It's something that is eternal. Secondly, the second point is, he says in verse 10, if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. If you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? Honesty, trustworthiness, and faithfulness, he says, are important attributes. You've got to be honest. I remember reading about a pastor who, who uh, was uh, telling his congregation how every week a lady would come to him and hand him uh, pencils and erasers and uh, little, little things, stationary stuff. And uh, so he, he never needed to get any for himself. And uh, one day he told her, he said, listen, I, I have plenty. Stop you know, getting me all these things. And she said, oh, no problem. She said, I work as an administrator in my office, and all of these things are in my office, and I just bring them and give them to you. You have to be honest with the smallest of things. The things that are available in your office which don't belong to you, don't belong to you. That's what Jesus is saying. Make sure that even the smallest things, 
you're honest with. If you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust, trust you with the true riches of heaven? God watches and sees how we are as we handle the things that he has given us. And if we are handling it well, then he will give us more to handle when we are in heaven. Thirdly, he says, how you handle the things that don't belong to you will determine how you handle the things that will belong to you. What is he talking about? The money that you and I have don't belong to us. We give 10% to God. The other 90%, God expects us to be good stewards. It doesn't belong to us. It's his. He has given that money to us to be stewards of that money. And it's important that we handle the things that don't belong to us well. Because when we go to heaven, we will then be given things that are ours. They belong to us because of the life that we lived here on earth. Remember what I told you last week about moving from being believers to being disciples. God looks at the way we live our lives post-regeneration. Post the time that we come to know him. And depending on the life that we live will be the rewards we get in heaven. And he says those things will belong to you. If you are able to treat the things that don't belong to you, which is the worldly wealth that you have well. So three things, he says, be honest, be trustworthy, and be faithful with little things, the wealth of the world, and with things that don't belong to you. And then finally, he says in verse 13, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You have to have only one person that you commit yourself to. You cannot be drawn to two people. It cannot be money and God. It's not a both and situation here. It's an either or situation. I I want to say Chuck Colson, and I know it's not Chuck Colson. Who was the other Chuck? Charles Swindoll. Swindoll. Thank you. Charles Swindoll once had the uh, opportunity to speak to a group of people. And he asked them to enumerate from 1 to 10 priorities in their lives. And they took the paper and they wrote 1, God, 2, family, 3, community, 4, vocation, 5, 6, 7. They went down that list. And all of them had it like that. Number one was God. And he took that and he looked at it and he said, this is wrong. You may have got the one right. Number one is God. But number two has to be God in family. Number three has to be God in work. Number four has to be God in community. He said God is never at the exclusion of anything that you and I do. God has to be integral to everything that we do. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. You have to be completely devoted to him. And that's the final point that Jesus is bringing. Where is your allegiance? For all the rest to come to play, he says, you have to start with this point, that God is number one in your life. Everything else must be refracted through his prism. Only then will it fit in with kingdom purposes. And so as we look at this parable, the dishonest manager, we see how Jesus has taken it and taught us three important lessons. And those lessons may be things that you and I need to cotton hold of, kind of get a hold of today. Maybe deal with it today. What part of our the things that we have are we using so that there will be kingdom changes, that many people around us will have eternal abodes rather than temporal ones? Are we using our money, our wealth, whatever we have, even a, a second mortgage as we found through Billy Graham. Are we using it for kingdom purposes? The second is, how are we like in terms of little things, responsibilities, 
those kind of things do we lift up the lord with those practices of honesty trustworthiness and faithfulness and then finally could it be that somehow something else has usurped that first place that god must have in our lives is it possible that somehow in the course of whatever situations and circumstances we face in the world that the job has taken priority or money has taken priority or relationship has taken priority i wonder whether god needs to be placed back on the throne room of our lives whether we need to consciously say lord you are number 1 in my life shall we pray master speak to us lord in the quietness of these moments and as we open up to you lord we invite you to come and do what needs to be done master as we give you our wills this morning lord if there are ways in which we have got mixed up with the things of the world highlight those things lord and just bring the power of your spirit to us so that we can quickly realign lord if we've not really bothered about people around us and the good things that you have blessed us with lord have been used for ourselves would you bring about a paradigm shift lord that we would begin to use those things that you have given us so that many will be part of eternal life or maybe lord this morning you need to reclaim the number one spot and as hearts yield to you lord would you quickly take that position speak lord holy spirit do your thing do what you do best lord in bringing us close to to the to jesus and the father's will and we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus amen